a five, six, seven. If you've got a question, the voices of resin are here. Plastics is an SPE sponsored podcast. Hey, Lindsay, how's it going? Oh, it is just fantastic here today. Is that I don't even know anymore. I can't uh, because we don't see people. I don't understand um, what is sarcasm and social what is cues. Real. Because what's Lost happening him. in the world, I don't understand. No, it's, it's real. Both kids slept through the night. I went to the gym. I had pretzels. I'm good. Oh, my God. That's You're all I need. You're actually living your best life. I. I mean, I would like to change into my fleece line sweatpants, but once I do that, then best life. You know, I had, I had a, a revelation about, about my car. So, um, Heather is how we have not yet introduced, but just, you know, I, I recently bought the first car of my life. I've always had hand-me-downs or, or work vehicles and bought a, a, a really nice car. And I realized that it's not my midlife crisis car. It's my best life crisis car. <laughs> I'm here for that. (laughs) So uh, we are both, Lindsay and I are both plastics professionals. And uh, I'm Mercedes Landazari, and that is? Lindsay Nubble. And uh, with our powers combined, we are? Plastics. Plastics. (laughs) Never going to get it. Never, not once. Um, (laughs) uh, But you can find us on uh, all the podcast places. YouTube. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, the most podcasty of all places <laughs> well it's the live version if you if you really want to see what like what outfit you're wearing how bad my hair is that's how wonderful the place your to lipstick go. is that i do i do well there uh, but yeah um apple podcast google podcast stitcher spotify all those good things um released by sve the first friday of every month um so today is the day after inauguration day which would make us what january 21st 2021 yes. 121 2021 there we no. go okay um and with us here today we have uh heather mcdougall a visionary entrepreneur and educator for planet allies and ceo of bogo brush welcome heather hello <laughs> good to be here <laughs> So tell us where in the world are you joining us from today? Because your yes. Instagram, I mean, you could be in Abu Dhabi. You can't you pin could you down. In the Netherlands. <laughs> Very sneaky. You could be, where are you? Yes. Um, so I am in North Dakota. I'm in literally the bedroom totally I grew up in. Stop. Really? Um, yeah. This is, it's a different color now, but yeah. I was just going to is... say, no, that was no way the color. That, <laughs> that, that is not, yeah. this is not a kid's no. bedroom. No, no, no. It's, it's now like the guest bedroom, uh, you know, situation, but, um, yeah, I'm always, or pre COVID, I was very much all over the place doing lots of work with sustainability and, um, understanding like global sustainability really is kind of where my heart lies. And, um, but of course, COVID has shifted that. So I've, I've only traveled very sparingly <laughs> this year. So what, just quick color question, as you know, I'm a, a color professional. What, um, what color was your bedroom growing up? Oh, I think the walls were white. Really? Yeah. Wow. I don't know what color I would have painted them. I had lots of color. You know, I had the one, one thing that's coming to mind. Do you remember... That NKOTB uh, poster? Was- totally. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, like those balls. Yeah, thanks. I totally spaced for a second. I was like, what am I trying to say? <laughs> There's like balls. They were like, they'd rotate, not a disco ball, but they had like a light in them and they'd like shoot light out all over the room. Oh, I them. know what you're t- They had like the, yeah, they had like the little circles of color. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I had one of those. I thought it was very cool. It was like not a lava lamp, but kind of the, I don't know, light version, I guess. Not like, a, like, like the blue. 90s vibe of a lot. Yeah, definitely. It was like, because I was vibe. like a preteen in the late 90s. And so it was like totally all that. I had that kind of stuff. But yeah, it is kind of interesting. I just had white walls, maybe partially because we moved into this house when I was like 13. And I, I don't know, I just was like so pumped up about a new bedroom that I didn't even <laughs> think about it I don't know <laughs> I love it <laughs> oh man that's yeah I, I I feel you though I think my bedroom walls were white but I think it's because my mom was just a very like let's keep everything white but then you can do whatever you want in the room so wow I'm with you I'm with you in the, on the team white but then 
chaos <laughs> in the background. <laughs> um, so I guess um, getting to the point of the podcast, because that's what we eventually get to. Um, so you have probably one of the coolest names, Educator for Planet Allies. Uh, a lot of people see plastics as kind of like anti-planet. Um, and, you know, yet you didn't turn us down for an interview. Uh, so <laughs> we have uh, obviously a bunch of questions kind of based around that. Um, but, you know, I guess the, the top one, the burning question is, you know, can you be a planet ally and still use plastics or, you know, be invested in plastics? Yes, I think that one of the, so as an educator for Planet Allies, really one of the main things I really focus on, especially first meeting a community or people is what I call like eco empowerment. And I think we live in an era where there's so much um, eco anxiety or climate anxiety, and it leads to um, hype and kind of fear around things, which is understandable, but if we don't get ourselves grounded in like feeling empowered and how do we make an impact, it just stays in this fear space. So from there, I think that happens with plastic. And of course, especially lots of single use plastics, um, especially oil like petroleum-based plastics, they are causing a lot of harm, but there's a lot of good that even environmentally has come out of plastics. And so to me, it's how can we get out of that like hyper anxiety around the word plastic and start seeing it for the value that it can have and shifting the things that aren't working. I think Lindsay and I just fell in love with you. <laughs> we did. That, that, that pause was just, just us being like, oh. Hmm. <laughs> I love it. Hmm. So, um, and we'll, we'll get back more into, into, um, into global sustainability in a little bit, but um, let's talk about the, the other title that you hold, CEO of Bogo Brush. What is Bogo Brush and how did it come about? Bogo Brush is a beautiful, sustainable toothbrush. Um, my brother and I created it because we wanted to do something to help bring more environmental and social awareness into people's daily routines. And for us, you know, we kind of joke that the idea probably started because we grew up as children of a dentist, uh, <laughs> like no plans to do anything with oral health. But as we discovered our passion for sustainability, and like I said, bringing these values into kind of more of a daily consciousness, we thought what better way than to reimagine a toothbrush. So yeah, we right. use responsible materials where we're really trying to repurpose waste. And then uh, we, we also donate 10% of our profits to sustainability causes all over the world. So that's the eco and the social component of why we say bringing those values into your daily routine. Love oh, it. I love that. Yeah. And um, I was just on a call earlier today and we were talking about, you know, this, there is that social and um, eco aspect that a lot of people are starting to look for. And, you know, we were talking about like the Bombas socks and like, mm -hmm. um, and I, I had just purchased some because, um, cause you know, I, I like that responsibility, especially cause there's a lot of things I'm not responsible about. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> gotta make Stop up it. for it somewhere. You give yourself <laughs> much too little credit, far too little. Um, so, you know, if there was one thing you could do differently about when you started up um, Bogo Brush, what, what do you think that would be? Mm. I, I mean, there's like different growth phases, you know, I mean, just in anything we do. So it's like at each phase or something that I've learned that maybe would, I guess, go a little differently. I think the biggest thing that I've learned in the last few years with it is really, um, being okay with accepting like my own value or like our founder team's value and getting paid sooner, <laughs> frankly, like, um, and along with that is recognizing the value of, of a team. I think there's a, a strong um, culture in the startup world, maybe lots of worlds, but I'm familiar with the startup world. So it's like that extreme bootstrap, like do as much as you can for as long as you can. And, you know, you have to prove you're worth it until you are. And I think that that's just a, it's, it's something that pervades, especially an American culture, like right. a very 
um, productivity driven culture, but it's damaging. And I reached a burnout yeah. a couple of years ago and largely it's cause I wasn't standing in, in like the progress that I needed to make as a leader and was staying kind of stuck in the same bootstrap mentality. So I think it's, if I were to do anything differently, I guess it would be <laughs> maybe to align myself with mentors who were going to like empower that in me a mm. little bit more um, or just stand up for what I was really feeling in those moments rather than putting myself kind of on the back burner. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. So it's like beyond just um, like that, like kind of controlling like fear of delegation. It's like hey, this is the bootstrap culture. I need to do everything. It's wow. That's right. And I guess, I mean, that's, that's a, a key thing to, for people to keep in mind that I'm sure a lot of people are overlooking in their own, you know, startups or whatever, because, you know, I can see that being a, no, I got to do it. I got to do it. But it's like, if you burn yourself out, where's your passion for yeah. you know, furthering this? Yeah. Totally. And like, at least for me and probably a lot of us, you know, it's like creatives, like so much of the fun is in like the next challenge is in creating a solution for the next phase of something. So at one point in starting Bogo Brush, which what was really exciting and creative, like, oh, how do we build a mold? You know, like I had no idea <laughs> at one point in time, like that was fascinating. And it was so interesting to explore and, and problem solve. But then, you know, for me, like, that's not my expertise. And so in some ways it's like a control thing, but also not, yeah, it's like a, it's a mix mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of not realizing I was staying in control when it wasn't, when it wasn't right. So bringing on help really helped like free that up and keep me in like a zone of genius as it were, um, mm -hmm. to be kind of like driving forward with that. So and, yeah. you know, leave the mold designing to the people who love it. Yeah, like, that's Lindsay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I will gladly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talking about, you know, driving things forward, um, my personal favorite Heather initiative is um, – is thanking your garbage, thanking the things that you throw away. And, you know, I, I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, Irish and Ecuadorian, you know, Catholic family, we, you know, said grace every night. And so it felt like a similar process to me where you're, but kind of like at the end of it, right? When you're saying grace with dinner, it's like, you're thinking, you know, the, the people who prepare the food, the land that the food came from, everything, you know, the people who planted the seeds and, and with garbage, it's like a similar process. Can you walk us through that? Do you call it thinking your garbage or? I call it gratitude, your garbage. Cause you know, alliteration oh. is fun. It is. <laughs> Love it. But, but yeah, I mean, thanking your garbage works too. It's, 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 um, it stems out of, um, similar like just understanding like how do we appreciate our food the things that are coming into our life and and treating that with respect but then also thinking through it on a level of anxiety garbage a lot of people me included in the past in the past it's like we have a guilt association when you know a lot of people do at least when you throw something away and i think that one way to um move through guilt is by practicing gratitude and understanding what it is. And the other piece is that to me, sustainability is about becoming very in tune with how we are all connected, how everything is earth. Mm -hmm. Even that plastic wrap that's garbage that feels gross to throw away because you're like, oh, it's going to sit in the landfill forever. Like that did come from the earth somewhere. So by saying thank you to it, like you're throwing away a plastic wrapper or, you know, whatever it is, say, thank you. And take a moment to acknowledge the resources that went into it and connect to that on a little bit of a deeper level. And then that little bit that feels guilty, you know, for me is like, oh crap, you know, like this is, this is not, this is not like a wholesome life cycle for this really valuable, right? Plastic is so valuable and we treat it like crap. Yeah. And it's like, you see that and you're like, oh man, I, I want to feel empowered to do better next time. I want to feel empowered to find a solution or I want to, you know, it just gives more of a, to me, more of a hopeful perspective on, on something instead of getting dragged down into just the guilt and feeling bad. 
Yeah. Or maybe rinse it out and reuse it. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I, I think I came across the gratitude, your garbage on, on your Instagram and you, you had suggested that people try it for a week, which I found hard just to remember, but even for a day, it's, it's a yeah. paradigm shifting. Can you, can mm-hmm. you talk us through just like a, like, like, your actual, like the last thing you threw away. Can you say, can you, can you gratitude the last thing you threw away? Yes. Um, can you throw something away now? <laughs> Let me see. What do I have? Uh, <laughs> the last thing I threw away, um, I mean, probably was like food scraps actually like off of my plate. So I suppose just going through that, you know, it's like, thank you so much, these food scraps, like thank you to like the chickpeas and the, the tomatoes and all of the energy that went into you to create it. You know, I acknowledge that our energy is part of, is part of the same thing. And, you know, thank you for reminding me that wasting you is like not the most wholesome like cycle to fulfill. So, um, I will use this moment to remind myself of that. Like next time I serve myself food, um, something like that. I love it. My last garbage, Lindsay, feel free to, to jump in and share if we're doing that. But my last garbage I threw away was a tequila bottle. Um, I want to say thank you to the, um, to the, the store that sold me, the, the people working at the store who wore their masks. Uh, made of made of plastic um and the uh you know the trucks that uh, that brought the bottles there from the from the blow molders the fillers the bottle fillers as well the the resin that weren't even going glass no no come on it's a global (laughs) pandemic you have to buy in bulk you're gonna buy you're gonna buy the plastic bottle because it's easier for for delivery um uh but yeah no but I, i i love the i love the gratitude your garbage it's just it's really enlightening to think through um, you know, the, everybody involved in the process and all the transportation, you know, um, it's like, like I said, it, I mean, you're, you're, I love that you're an educator for planet allies because mm-hmm. that's so much of what's missing, you know, is mm-hmm. the education. Yeah. There's a big mm-hmm. disconnect. Um, and, and kind of getting back into that, like plastics planet alignment, um, you know, what are your like top three things that you would want the plastics industry to see them change, us change. Mm. Um, I would love, all right, I'll try to keep track of three. <laughs> you can do I more. Would, you can do more. I'll be writing them all down. <laughs> My brain is like this connected web of things. And so a lot of times like narrowing things into categories gets a little like challenging just the way because I'm like oh that connects to this and this and this and this and it's like oh um fun for me but not maybe that organized (laughs) um (laughs) but yeah I think the plastics industry I would love to see I guess I'll say like education to molders on using like shall we call it alternative plastics I kind of like to spell plastics with an x you know like I X because I mean the definition of plastic is something that's very misunderstood on its own right (laughs) absolutely so like how do we it's a yeah that's maybe another thing it's like education based I suppose is like how do we also help consumers understand what does plastic mean and to kind of take away like the swear word quality of it (laughs) but um with the industry is creating more resources, more education for molders to understand how to work with these materials. I mean, for us, right, we work with several materials, but the most challenging is like a biocomposite PLA, um, which I don't know if non-plastic people watch this, but basically, right, it's like a plant a stark <laughs> mixed with plant, real plant material. And that has a very different process to it than like a kind of typical polypropylene. And so that's been one of the huge curves for our company is, you know, finding partners that are willing to take that time and energy to devote to learning how to, how to work with these materials so that they can scale. Um, So I would say that um, I think continuing to innovate in spaces to replace like oil-based plastics with single use. That's definitely um, to me a big, a big component. So that single use materials um, also get a little bit of a, a story shift. They don't become quite so, I don't know, bad. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously we want, we want all of our products to be like in the world to be valued and to be able to fill into a life cycle so that their creation and their consumption is a very even like beautiful uh, mm-hmm. flow. Right. Um, and I think single use items have a, have a strong potential for helping the world understand that if we use more responsible materials. And, and I, and I feel like I, I agree with you. And I also, as Lindsay knows, I really, really hate the term single use, you know, mm. because it should always go someplace else. And that idea even of single use is, you know, that's the opposite of gratitude in your garbage. It's just like, okay, mm, mm-hmm. done with it. Right. Bye girl. And I mean, it's, we need to, we need to, to shift our mentality away from, even if we're just using it in this form one time, you know, we can use it in a different form another time. And, and so I, I just, it's, I absolutely, that's my swear word is single use. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, they're, I mean, single use, traditional single use plastics, I will continue, continue to use and, and use them in different forms and reuse them. But that actual word, I hate it. Single use. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's almost like a, I don't know. It almost creates a laziness yes. around innovation or around right. our like, just kind of even the general population of like, oh, that's just a single use thing. Like, first mm-hmm. of all, you feel kind of bad if you're conscious mm-hmm. about the environment, but then if you're not, yeah, it's just telling you it's single use. It's not signaling at all that there's any real value to the materials and the process and the people that went into creating that really valuable item. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, SPE has uh, their their plastic van, and which goes into schools and like educates children on, um, you know, um, different types of plastic and just plastic in general. But they just recently um, started a sustainability um, curriculum, I guess, mm-hmm. and um, I don't think it's rolled out nationwide. I could be I could be wrong, but they started it out on um, the West Coast, and you know. It, uh, the SP foundation, uh, director, Eve Vitale was talking about it. And, you know, she kind of, she kind of mentioned how, like, you just have to kind of go in there and like blow past all the like single use plastic, like, cause it's just like, otherwise you just are going to get hung up yeah. each time being like, Oh, well, it's single use. Well, it's pl- plastic bags are bad. Oh, straws are bad. And it's like, hold on. <laughs> hold on, this is a whole, there's a whole life cycle that goes into all of this. There's a whole avenue that this can all take. There's a whole, you know, different direction than what you're just being shown sometimes. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's like a broad third thing is to help create more channels for that continuing life Mm -hmm. for these materials is, I mean, we see it in some places um, I don't know how much it is exactly where I am now, but right, like plastic <laughs> bag returns or mm-hmm. like, how do we, how do we also create a behavioral shift um, or yeah, finding a way to allow plastic materials that are going to have like a landfill end of life. Like how do we help shift that and create an avenue that's easy um, and also economically viable for folks to participate in? Mm-hmm. Mercedes, is this where I spiral into my Twitter story from the other day? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go for it. This is a, it's incredibly frustrating that this particular um, so, news story yeah. interaction. Yeah. So I'm in, I'm in Erie, Pennsylvania, and um, there's been conversations um, with a company called IHG to create one of like the world's largest plastics recycling facilities. Um, it would be some traditional um, plastics recycling. Um some, you know, recycling into like, uh, just regrind or compound that like, um, cause Erie's kind of like a hot spot for plastics that we can, um, we being the injection molders or manufacturers of the area can buy back and use in our own product. And then the third component of it is anything that can't be traditionally recycled or, you know, reground or fed back into the industry itself would be um, ground and shipped to um, right across the lake to Canada, um, where it'd be used as fuel within the um, steel manufacturing. So it basically replaces- like through, through incineration or? Yeah, so okay. it, I think they call it like, they call it something 
like zero emission something. Okay. I don't know. I'd have to look up the exact word, um, <laughs> which makes me sound really smart and educated on this. Um, <laughs> but basically <laughs> it's replacing the fuel source that would traditionally be used to stoke those mm-hmm. fires with this plastic that can't be, you know, um, used another way or currently can't be used another way. And, uh, our local, um, it, it's not the newspaper, but it's like a local article writer. It, it's all opinion pieces. It's not, none of them are meant to be fact-based pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> so sorry if you are. Um, <laughs> and they, <laughs> They, uh, they wrote an article of uh, basically just like slamming this whole thing. And so I posted about how, like, that's a very disappointing take on it because, you know, this is maybe not, it's, it's by no means perfect. There is no perfect solution as of yet, but one step forward in order to, you know, give us the opportunity if, you know, when technology advances for us to kind of like come along and like, Hey, look, we have this facility here. We don't have to go build a new facility. We can, we can work with it and we can start recycling more and, you know, get more out and compounded and back into the hands of manufacturers to rerun and all that stuff. And, um, (laughs) I, I, I aggravated, I think. Yeah. uh, It was, yeah, he, he, yeah, he or she just really went to town on on your Twitter, but it, you know, and I mean, it goes back to that thing of plastics being a dirty word. It's like, here you Mm -hmm. have, you know, this, this, you know, company wanting to start a recycling facility to, um, to, to reuse this waste and, and to, and to find additional places for the waste that can't then, you know, be recycled. And, and plastics is, is such a swear word that it's like, no, we're not even going to let the recycling company in. Like, you know, (laughs) it's just, yeah. It's like, and once I'm like hearing that all kinds of things popped in my head, but one of the big themes is like, okay, but even if we were to get rid of all petroleum-based plastic production mm-hmm. right now, yep, like there's still tons of it around. Like, what are we gonna do with it? Like, right. Yes. And it can be reused so many times. I mean, I'm being very general with that. Like, there's all kinds right. of like <laughs> nuances, but overall, it's like that's one thing is it's still gonna exist. So yeah. What how can we, how can we try to use it? How can we try to get more value from that and into like the life cycle that, that right. energy, everything, right. like, yes. I mean, everything energy. comes back down to energy. Yeah. So you have to recapture we- it. Even if it's through incineration, at least, mm-hmm. you, you know, you're using that energy instead of bearing it. And, you know, it, it, it um, Heather, like you are just a hundred percent, like, you know, singing my, like, I love it so much. Um, the, the, it was a couple of years ago, um, the vice president of design for Whirlpool, uh, Jay Mayes, who was formerly of, um, you know, Ford designed several of the, um, the Mustangs. Um, mm-hmm. actually he also designed all of the cars in the movie cars <laughs> for Disney. He worked for Disney in between, uh, but, now he's, but now he's, but now he's VP of design for Whirlpool. And he was asked a question of, um, uh, at, at the international design conference a couple of years ago, um, about cradle to cradle. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a great question. And he just, I don't know if he panicked or what his thing was, but he said, I'm going to say something that's going to make an impact on everyone here. He said, we have to stop using plastic. And I said, no, <laughs> like, because exactly like you said, no, even if we stop using it, it's still going to be out there. And there are reasons that we started using it in the first place. It was an environmental solution. I always say that turned into an environmental problem, but but it's still going to be mm-hmm. there. And so I say, turn that, we have to stop using plastic to, we have to stop abusing plastic, you know? Yeah, exactly. I think about it. There's a, um, like a calculation I did last summer. I was just so curious. Like part of my background is studying sustainable economic theory and just like, how does, Oh yeah, no, economic- same. Totally. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Are we in the class together? No, <laughs> but we tell we're smart like you. <laughs> oh well, I mean, I it's like a theory level thing, you know. I'm definitely not into like the the particulars of exactly like how is the economy working right now. But it, through that, right, there's a principle of economics that's scarcity, and scarcity is one of the principles that's supposed to help drive cost. 
essentially, mm-hmm. like how much things cost us. So, right, if there's a lot more of something in the in the world, but specifically, let's talk about natural natural resources. If there's more of it, then that means it should cost us less. And if there's less of it, then that means it should cost us more. <laughs> And I just was thinking about this and I, cause I always think that oil in general is, or coal or any of these like fossil fuel kinds of like carbon rich um, resources are highly undervalued, highly underpriced. Like this is part of the problem is our economy Mm. isn't appropriately valuing them. Like mm -hmm. plastic should be so expensive because it's so valuable like it has or oil right it has so much energy in it millions of years of plants and dinosaurs and whatever else is like going into it so I like did a comparison I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head but I did some research and compared like oil versus gold and actually like there's a lot less predicted nobody really knows but there's a lot less oil in the world remaining than there is gold. And it was some crazy amount, like gold is actual, like, I don't know, gold is overvalued by like a hundred thousand times compared to (laughs) the value of oil or like something in there. I can look it up, like how I did the calculation, but basically, yeah, that's only basing on like one principle of economics scarcity. It's just to me, it's like to drive home this point that yeah, we are abusing it. It's Mm -hmm. so valuable. And, you know, Mercedes, that's what like triggered it for me is you saying that word, like we're abusing this really, really valuable resource. So how do you align something oil that can be turned into something like plastic? How do you align that so that it's energy, it's value is getting like the longest life time possible. It's a material that lasts hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Like let's put it into things that, it can do really well in that context. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And let's find like in the like, context where a product is really only supposed to last a year or a few days, like let's find properties <laughs> we like about this, but find a different way to create it. Let's stop abusing something just because we have it. Yeah. Ah, yes. I love it. I love it so much other. Um, so um, thank you so much for joining us. So we're just about out of time. But uh, where can we learn more about Bogo Brush and everything else you're up to and, and what's next? Besides stalking you on Instagram, yeah, I already did that this morning. So well, yeah, what's your Instagram? Give us a, every place that, that our listeners okay. can, can follow you. So you can stalk me on Instagram at hello <laughs> dot. So it's like, hello, this is Heather. But there's like a dot and then some underscores in there. Uh, so hello, this is Heather. Um, or at Bogo Brush, you can always find me through through that um email for me it's hello at this is heather that's my email so please feel free to hit me up there uh bogle brush uh go to the website there's a contact form and either of those ways someone will get to me or i can get you to bogle brush and we'd love Perfect. to hear from you awesome amazing well uh heather mcdougall thank you so much for for your time today this has been yes. just absolutely wonderful um and uh <laughs> and this look, is why we set we set time limits because otherwise we would have made this a three-hour podcast yeah it would have been three hours nobody wants that <laughs> <laughs> nope <laughs> different instrument if you've got a question the voices of res and i hear And next time, Heather, you'll have to sing with me because I know you were in that trio in, um, what was it, United Arab Emirates? Fade yeah. Out and Fade Out. Yeah. No. <laughs> I played ukulele as well. I could have like Oh, along. man. <laughs> I'll just clap. <laughs> Gotta have the rhythm section.